I'm going to con- finish the series of messages today, uh, God-sized faith. We'll talk about persevering faith. Let me read you a passage of Scripture, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Let me ask you this question today. Do you ever feel run down? Anybody say you ever feel run down? Sure you do. You feel like the handheld device that you often find yourself holding on to working, and then you look at it and you see the battery is, uh, you got a notification that says uh, uh, low battery, getting ready to quit, 20%, 10%, uh, whatever you're using and you're looking, I need an outlet, I need a power source, and it's like, if you would just let me rest a minute and recharge. And a lot of time in life, we feel that way, don't we? we? We feel like we're going and we're going and we're going and we just can't, we just run down. You think about the things we deal with on a daily basis. Just normal everyday life. If you have kids, you know that they need to be waking up in the morning and meals made and driven to school and clothes washed and they need to be bathed and to take them to practice and you take them to doctor's appointments. They need help with homework. And the list just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? There's work responsibilities. Quotas you need to meet. Meetings to make. Short staffing issues. Deadlines. Budgetary constraints. Supply shortages. That list goes on and on as well, doesn't it? You have relationships. You're, you're trying to make quality time for your spouse. and You have kids and parents. And you have friendships. And if you're not married, maybe you're even trying to date. There are financial struggles. There are health concerns. There's pressures of just living in a broken world. There's financial struggles. And people go, oh, I don't know how because I get so blinded by the things that are going on in my personal struggle that I fail to see anything else. And so you get stressed. A recent poll found that 40% of people feel stressed on a daily basis. And another 39% say that they sometimes feel stressed. The truth is life can be so demanding. No one's going to be immune from it. As a matter of fact, as the old saying goes, the struggle is real, right? We want to just say, Jesus, take the wheel. But too many times we don't stop long enough to ask Jesus to take the wheel because we're in the struggle. Notice I haven't even included church responsibilities in those lists. You know the reason for that? It's because the problem we run into is we're spending all of our time living in the areas that we mentioned before. Then if there is time and we have the energy... Well, we'll include worship, youth group, Sunday school, other faith-building services that could be going on. The headline for an article published in Christianity Today in 2019 stated this. 35 million young people to have abandoned the Christian faith by 2050. The article states that we're in desperate need of a revival in America as we see it today. One of the shape that took place of the Great Awakening during Jonathan Edwards' time. Jonathan Edwards went around and he preached primarily to young people. And it was a youth movement that took place during that revival as the Holy Spirit touched their lives that helped shape the Christian nation that we grew to love and became so proud of. For the church to persevere, we're going to need that kind of revival all over again in the youth of America. We love to say we want to have revival. But we need revival in those who don't know Jesus. According to the report with 35 million youths raised in Christian families projected to disaffiliate from Christianity by the year 2050, youth ministry leader Greg uh, Steyer believes churches can't settle for simply slowing down the bleeding. We like to do that, don't we? We get a little cut, we get an injury, and we just say, i got to put a little pressure on it. Maybe that'll slow the bleeding down. That'll stop after a while. But he says... How about not just slowing down the bleeding? What if there was a revival that flipped those stats? That's what we need to be praying for. How do we flip the switch? So our leadership says we're going to flip the switch. We're going to do something different. We're going to invest in whatever God wants us to invest in so that we can start that revival. 
You see, there needs to be this urgent, pressing need in the church today that we can help draw people back to Jesus. That urgent is, is, is so, that need is so urgent because the last millennials are now nearly 20 years old. All the data suggests that most people will settle in their respective faith affiliations by the age 25. If they haven't done so, normally by age 35, they just close that door altogether. And they'll say, I'm not, I don't go to church. I'm not interested in anybody's faith. You have what you want. You heard that enough? You believe what you want to. All roads lead to the same God. You do whatever it is. Just don't push that stuff on me. And now we find out that uh, as that takes place, that the Gen Zs are now going off to the same secular colleges that are now being influenced by and taught by some of these same older millennials. They're teaching the classes and they're instructing them. Look, I have, I'm, I'm in a unique position in the world. I have a millennial and a Gen Z. I've got a 29-year-old and a 20-year-old. I've got one that come in toward the uh, middle to latter part of the millennials, and then I've got one of the early Gen Zs. So I can see different perspectives. And what I do see is a great opportunity in the Gen Z generation. If you haven't figured it out, if you want to look around and you want to see the state of your local governments and everything and the people who would cast votes, most likely it's going to be your millennials and your Gen Zs are going to be your largest voting demographic. And therefore, therefore, they will make decisions for you, not based on faith, but what their personal felt need will be at any given moment. The report also calls for a transformation in youth discipleship, contending that youth ministry models of the last 50 years were just no longer effective. You know, it's hard to say that, isn't it? Because it worked for me. It reached me, and if it reached me, to be sure, it should reach somebody else. It worked. And every time we make a change in the church, you say, why would you make some type of change in the church? It worked, and it did work. And say, so it wasn't wrong. It just doesn't maybe fit where God has placed us to minister in today's society and culture. And so we have to say, God, where do you place me now? It's like eating when you go to a restaurant Often, many people are creatures of habit, and we will go to a certain restaurant to dine on a certain meal. Will we not? I like so-and-so at this restaurant, and I get it every time I go. But what if they didn't have your favorite, whatever it was, when you went? And you had to choose something else. And all of a sudden now, you become disillusioned over that favorite place anymore because it's not offering what I once appreciated so good, and I love there. Too many young people today are not seeing Jesus lived out in the lives of those who should be leading them to Christ. But despite all this, as we think about transforming youth discipleship, Spire says this. He's excited about what the re report reveals because he's praying for that great awakening. Revival is something that God brings about, and it can change things so quickly if we just let him do it. Jonathan Edwards' revival was chiefly among the youth, and so it was them who shaped the America that you and I now enjoy. And what if a student youth movement was what would bring us back to our roots and unite the nation and transform it from the inside out? So we got a great opportunity. But the churches must be fully on board. Here's another statistic that I had never even thought about. Did you know that churches outnumber high schools and middle schools five to one? What if all of our churches were on board would say, we're going to impact these schools? We're outnumbering them. Now, as I shared last week, Barna and Stadia say, if things continue on the current trend, within the next three years, 70,000 churches could close in the United States. So we got to stay strong as a church. Persevere in your faith in Jesus. Don't give up on what God's trying to do and what he's trying to accomplish in the world because he didn't give up on us. And friends, I believe the mission of the church is just that. It is to stay and hang on to Jesus as best as you possibly can. Because it's the only thing that offers hope for eternity 
forever. And that's only going to come through the blood of Jesus applied in our lives. And they're going to need it as well. That's why it's so important to persevere in our faith. Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And so as I said, as we close this series of messages today, God-sized faith, I want us to look at what a persevering faith will do in your life as a follower of Jesus and also in his church. I want you to understand this, that your faith in Jesus is the most important thing that could ever happen to you and you can ever have. So persevere in it because it lets you hold on to the hope that you should have. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Not Daniel. Not you. But he's the one who promised it. He's the one who's going to be faithful. Hold on to it. When so many things in the world around you seem to be collapsing before your very eyes, don't you give up on Jesus. He never gave up on you. The Hebrew writer would continue to tell us these words. In Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and he will be forever. You can't give up on him. I've often said if anything changed between your relationship and Jesus, it weren't Jesus. It was you. Since Jesus is never changing in a constant changing world, that gives us the confidence that we can hold unswervingly is the word that's used to him. I had a recent phone conversation with a, a representative from LifeWay Research. In call, talking with the gentleman, he revealed that a good number of ministers, pastors, and preachers are discouraged with the current state of their churches. You live through a pandemic church. Many say they found that their congregation had not really been equipped to handle the type of adversity the pandemic would bring in the form of challenging the members' faith. So as a result, pastors felt that they nor their church leaders had adequately prepared the members for real test to their faith. Guilty. Can I admit that? Guilty. But friends, Jesus is the same God who, who was there the day the universe was formed. He is the same God that was there when he says, let us make man in our image in Genesis chapter 1. He's the same God who was there today. He says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning to the earth. How quickly God can dispel evil from his presence. And yet it gets all around us and we just assume that's the way things are. But he says, you persevere in your faith so that you don't lose your hope. And that's the God that I serve. And this persevering faith will let you hold on to the hope that, that he is the one who one day will say with a great shout, that's it, I'm all done with it, but come home. Oh, by the way, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful. And I'm excited that our leadership, as I said, has this great need and saw the great need to invest in the future generations of the church. And we're going to have to invite you into it. We, we've already, in our hearts, been praying, God, all right, what, how can we step up? How can we share? How can we financially help? But we're going to need you to do that. But you know why we're making this decision now, even as the church attendances around our nation are declining by as much as 50%? Because there's still hope, and we persevere in our faith. Secondly, I want you to understand, a persevering faith will allow you to obtain the promise of God. Paul would write in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 21, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth, it, worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to its frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from the bondage of decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the Children of God. Did you know that you are the creation of God? Let's just be honest. Just because you're a follower of Jesus doesn't mean your life will be trouble free. Get amen on that? We, we mentioned just a laundry list of things that we go through every day. And that, those are normal, everyday living things. Don't, don't think about sickness. 
persecution for your faith. The world's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And yet, that's why I think it's so hard when people are struggling, when they're conflicted with, what do I trust? Where does my fear kick in? Do I trust God that He will keep me safe and protect me? And if I do get sick, I'm going to be okay. Regardless of what's going to happen, I had the conversation this week with a couple of men when they said, well, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing all right. It's better than the alternative. Well, he's, you heading to hell? Where are you going? I'm on this side of the dirt. Look, when, when it's my time, I'm going to see Jesus. And I have to hold on to that. I don't look forward to leaving this beautiful woman over here and my children and my granddaughter. I, I, that's not something I look forward to every day. But if God says, all right, Dan, you're going to fall out in the pulpit today. Y'all going to go, oh! and I'm going to go, Poof. gone. I'm ready. What about you? I'm ready to obtain the promise of God. But this broken world is always competing for our attention. It wants you to think that you can just put your faith in some other man-made item or some type of solution. And if you haven't figured it out, people are broken. And their schemes, the Bible says, are just that, uh, the, man, the things of a person's mind. They're just schemes. They could care less about you and I most of the time. They just want to make themselves look better, feel better, or either financially better. And sometimes there will always be a conflict between whether you follow Jesus or you, you, you follow the ways of the world. And so you must be willing daily to, no matter what you face, to run it through the filter of your faith in Jesus. You may even suffer as a result. I've known people who have uh, lost friends because they say they're followers of Jesus. They believe in him. You might lose a job as things are getting more difficult in the climate that we have today. You could be kicked out of a class if you're a student because you're holding to your faith. You don't believe something's been taught or you've been questioned and you have to open up about it. But you hold on to it. You hold on to Jesus because when all said and done, the only thing you can really hold on to when you get to glory is going to be the hem of the garment of the one who got you there. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Jesus says, in this world, you're going to have some trouble. Take heart, I've overcome the world in John chapter 16. So, friends, the promise is that if you persevere in your faith in Jesus, you will overcome the world as well. Glory is awaiting. Take as many people as you possibly can with you. Stay true to Jesus. And then I want you to understand your work will be rewarded. Second Corinthians, uh, Chronicles, excuse me, 15 verse 7 says, But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. One of my favorite passages in Scripture is John 14. Now, I've used it on numerous occasions uh, for uh, funeral, funerals that I've been asked to officiate. And it is a great passage for that. I mean, it, it talks about a life well lived and the reward that's there. But as I have grown and now as I read it, I, I find it as a motivation just to keep pressing on. Jesus says what? You trust, trust in God, trust also in me and my Father's house of many, many mansions. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll go and take you to be where I am. Right? So we think that's great. Then, but then Jesus says, there's going to be one way to get there. <laughs> you know? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody's going to come to the Father except through me. If you want to get in the Father's house, you're going to have to get through Jesus. And so what I find is that, that it gives me great encouragement not to lose heart, to, to stay the course that I'm having to walk and go on today and work for the kingdom because there's a great reward waiting for me when I get there. I don't have to wait to die. I can watch the progression of it take place now. And so it is with you. Don't give up now. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've come too far to turn back. And if you haven't already made the decision to follow Jesus, what's keeping you from doing that? Because faith in Jesus is where it's at. So why not trust him? Jesus says, I'm the way, and I'm the truth, and I'm the life. 
Now, that seems to be a scary thought in today's religious climate, doesn't it? I mean, even for the most devout followers of Jesus, depending on the circumstances you find yourself in, it's easy, easy to shut yourself off. Say, well, I'm not going to tell nobody. I don't believe what they're teaching. I'm not going to tell anybody that I'm a follower of Jesus. But you must do it. You have to be bold. He calls us to be bold. And he will protect us, and he wants to reward us for our faithfulness. His word reminds us over and over again of how he watches over us and cares for us. In Psalm 91, verse 4, it says, He will cover you with, with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge, and his faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You can get out and do it. You can follow Christ. When, when you have God as your shield, there's nothing that he can't do for you or for anyone who love and trust in him. And your work will be rewarded for it. So persevere. And then finally, I want you to understand, as I rush through this message this morning, uh, that your faith, as you allow it to persevere in you, needs to be at work. I don't want you to get sidetracked. But don't lose your crown. Don't lose your crown. I, I read last week uh, about the Miss France pageant, beauty pageant. Miss France. They're being sued by three of their contestants. Now get this. Because they didn't win and they felt like that the pageant was basing their selection on, you ready? Physical appearance. It's the Miss France beauty pageant. It's a beauty pageant. Now, now there are other requirements like no minimum. You you know you got to be you can't be short. You got to be at least five foot five. So be some of us are going to probably be out of that. Can't have any tattoos, no piercings other than earrings. Uh, you, you must be single. You never been married. Not have any children. They they're not suing about that. Those who are filing the lawsuit say that French labor law forbids companies, in which Miss France is a company, from discrimination based on a number of things, one of which is physical appearance. In other words, can we all admit the obvious? They are upset that they didn't get the crown. To which I'm just saying, come, Lord Jesus. Now's as good a time as any. Because that's the world that we're living in. And as trivial, as ridiculous as the lawsuit may sound, I'm afraid that many people trade something of far greater worth every day in pursuit of worldly pleasure. And the Bible tells us that we should be different. You and I should not look for worldly crowns, but for a heavenly crown. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So you do, do you know what you need to do? Persevere in your faith. Don't give up. Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I, have also, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Now, the world is fast approaching the last day. We've heard it preached since we were all little kids, and we've got various generations in here. But I 100% believe these are the last of the last of the days and we must keep the commandment to endure to the end and do whatever God calls us to do do it patiently friend if you hold on to Jesus and don't lose your crown he's got something far greater for you than what's going to get stuck in this world because even if Miss France has to give everybody a crown nobody wins But if you hold on to your faith in Jesus, you persevere, you serve him, you love him, you be the person God called you to be, you get the crown that will last forever. Jesus says if you'll do that and you hold on to that crown, he's going to keep you and I from 
and protect us from the time of trial that the whole world will have to endure before the final judgment comes. So what can you do? Well, listen to what the Apostle Paul says as we close. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing that I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize to which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Did you pick it up? Did you get what he said? Let me sum, up, sum it up in three words. Don't get stuck. Too many people get stuck. He said, don't you get stuck. Don't you keep looking back. It's okay to reflect, but don't keep looking back. Too many accidents have been happened in parking lots because somebody was looking behind them and they didn't recognize what was happening in front of them. God is calling you to do something for his kingdom. He's calling you and I heavenward on a daily basis. The crown is yours if you want it. You just have to take hold of it. But I want you to understand this. If you have yours already, don't lose it. Friends, persevering faith lets you hold on to the hope that you can obtain the promise of God. Do whatever he calls you to do, whenever he calls you to do it, even if you don't understand it, because he will reward you for whatever he's asking you to do in this season of your life. And as a result, being a child of the king, you can take hold of your crown and know that nobody can take it, but you can lose it. What you can do is say, God, I want to be your child. I want to be completely surrendered to you. I, I want to know that my faith is something that has been built, that I know that nothing, no matter how bad things go, it will not shake who I am in Jesus. And so as you get ready for this time of invitation, we're making decisions. We're making big decisions for the church. But the most important decision is, what have you done with Jesus? How are you walking with him? Have you ever fully surrendered to Christ being your, your God? One day, he's going to be the one who comes back. He will be the one who will be both the one who justifies us and judges us. Where do you stand when you stand before that God? Too many things in the world are vying for your attention. Too many things are trying to scare you away from God. But Jesus says, can I just embrace you and make everything okay? Will you surrender to him today if you don't already know him? If you already are follow of Jesus, commit yourself today to God. I will persevere in the faith that I have in you, and I want it to grow. I don't want it to shrink back. And whatever you call me to do, though, I may not understand it. I'm going to give it a whirl. As Brother Jimmy said, get out there and tell somebody. I tell people all the time, preaching ain't like it used to be. I had a conversation yesterday with Amy about I said, you remember, I remember as a little boy, preachers went around from every door and knocked on the door, and they, they talked to people. And they came, you, You're not invited there anymore. They'll, they'll shut the blinds on you. I tell everybody all the time, the Jehovah Witnesses ruined it for everybody. <laughs> but you're just not welcome like that. I mean, I, I invite, I, I encourage people. I want people to know Jesus, and I tell them every week. I, somebody, every day I'm telling somebody about Christ or inviting them to come to our church. But my influence is nowhere what your influence could be. That's how the church grows. If I can see 10 in a day, and you see 10, and you see 10, and you see 10, if we invite all 10, statistically, one out of 100 will show up. You know how many invitations it takes to get one person to come to the church? Much less, you got to do that same statistic again, to offer that invitation over and over again to come to Jesus? So we are stronger together as a church. And our movement in the youth should be one, not simply of meetings, but mission. And it should be one of advancing the kingdom of God. That they will be disciple, multiplying young people. Right? 
So as we pray, God, what will you have me do? How will you have me serve? And how can I be closer to you? Whatever God calls you to do in our time of decision, you'll respond to that. Father, thank you for loving us. We praise you for being a God who reminds us that you are bigger than us. We praise you, God, for the movement of the Holy Spirit today in this service. You've guided us. You've reminded us of your faithfulness. And we thank you for the songs that we've already sung, the power of the Holy Spirit moving and working in our lives. We've called out for revival in our songs. May it be something in our life. It starts here, God. It starts in the feet of the man who stands before this congregation, that you would revive me. It starts within the, the hearts of the people sitting and listening this morning. You will revive men. God, you will change our world. You'll change our local community. Because you can change our eternity. So we praise you for Jesus. We thank you, God, if we already have you, we can hold on to that faith. We thank you, God, that persevering faith is even available to the person today that needs to know you for the first time. They can know you by surrendering their life to you today, confessing Christ as Lord and Savior, repenting of whatever they have in their life, just wanting to walk a new life. They can be washed before they leave here in Christian baptism for the remission of their sins, the gift of your indwelling Holy Spirit. But most importantly, God, they go out of here a changed new creation. And I pray today if that's the decisions we need to make during this time, we will do that. If we need to be a member of this congregation, we're followers of Jesus. We've been immersed in Christ. We know who we are. We know where we need to be. We'll make those decisions as well. Most importantly, God, we will not leave here without understanding that you are bigger than we are and you want us, even though we feel so small at times. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.